Hello folks, this is Garth at GW Leathercraft and today I'm going to start a, a bandolier, uh, I call it the bandit, um, it's an, a shoulder uh, cartridge belt um, and um, so this is where I start, I have to cut the straps um now this is six to seven ounce um dark brown holster and strap um this is what i use and uh this is a piece that i've already done straighten the edge on but i just want you to see this is the straight edge that i use now this is a uh, I guess it's a savage brand, but anyway, this is a beautiful thing worth its weight in gold for and it's six feet long and You can almost get a full hide out of it now. So I use my strap cutter Now these here I make two and a half inches wide so I set the strap cutter to two and a half I'm going to have to straighten this corner out down here because it's just a little bit difficult. To start from that end with the end on such a slope. seen people do this quite fast. I usually take my time. Now I made that little bit of an error there in the beginning. That was because the end was on a slant, but I'm just going to straighten that up and then we'll go again. I need two, at, two pieces at two and a half. So... This is not the full hide. I've already cut about two feet off the end. I do that so I don't waste all that leather in narrow straps. leaves this piece what's left about five feet long and I find that pretty good six to seven ounce I'm not using it for belts uh, or heavy straps just for uh, light straps and and uh, in this case a uh, uh, shoulder belt so I need a couple uh, one inch straps now this is uh, what will make the lace for the for the cartridges When you're doing this, if you take this end and this hand, you're, uh, I'm right-handed, so this is uh, my other hand, the left hand, and um, if you just hold that pressure on it towards the direction of the um, tool, it keeps it from, uh, it keeps it more in line. It's, it's uh, important to do that because you... Uh, 
you want to end up with a straight strap, a straight line, you want to maintain that straight edge as long as you can. Depending on how things go, sometimes you have to fix it, but uh, ideally that would be minimal. there's a big belly in it it's not a problem really usually you won't notice that but these little little jogs are, are the ones that are the problem and the middle isn't usually the biggest problem it's usually the ends and the ends usually kind of get crooked but you just end up cutting that bit off so that is the four straps that I'm going to need for the for the, um, the cartridge belt. Now this is not um, really part of the video, but normally I keep my leather rolled up, um, flesh side out, and I just have these pieces of rope. A little heavier than is necessary, but it, it does the job. Uh, a loop on the one end and I just drag it around put it through the loop and a half hitch and it keeps it bundled up and ready for the next time so I'm gonna sign off here and I'll come back when I get situated so we're back and uh, whenever well I should I should say that this is uh, going to be what I consider my small. Um, it's probably a medium size for a, a medium to large size man. Um, generally, you're going to want it, as you get bigger, you're going to want it bigger. And uh, you're not going to want to try to use a small one because it's, uh, well, it's just not going to fit right. Um, and this is for 12 gauge. Um, so the, the, the not the uh, loops are quite big. Uh, if it was for uh, uh, 45 Colt or 38 or something like that, then I would do it with, uh, uh, I would make slots with a oblong punch and, and thread the lace through. Um, but where it's 12 gauge, I like to stitch the, the loops on. Now, I made up a little thing here. Now I do this when I'm starting, or when I'm, I'm um, going to be uh, doing a size that I don't know, uh, you know, already. Now this is one I did years ago for a 12. Well, it was for 12 gauge, but what I found was that 20 gauge wasn't that much different. So the size I use for 12 gauge is one and an eighth along the main belt and two and a quarter along the um, uh, lace and and it's it's works out pretty good most of the time if it's just double so you can uh, sort of use that but you have to have the right figures and and something that a lot of people don't realize it or at first they don't realize it when they're starting out is that the thickness of the leather makes a big difference um, uh, and and how tight you want it and how much uh, bend you're willing to accept in the back material. Um, let me just see if I got one here. So this is a 12 gauge and this is the 20 gauge loop and it goes in. But notice the bend in the back. So and the fact that it doesn't come out very easy which isn't very good either. Now this is what I the way I fit my 12s. Now it just slides in, slides out. It's fr got friction enough to hold it, but it's not uh, too tight, and it doesn't have the back all bent. So um, you know, keep that in mind. But the thickness, if you go with thinner uh, material for whatever reason, if all of a sudden you uh, change your mind and go a different way, you'll have to change the size of the loops because that affects it. So that is what we start out with. Uh, after we get to that point, and we, we know 
what we're aiming for. We have, oh yes. I've got to get my template, just a moment. So I shouldn't have really called it a template, because I'm sure you were expecting a bit more. Um, but it just gives me the, the two ends of the main belt. So we start off on the one end of the one, and mark that. Now you're not going to see what I'm lining that up with, but it's just the end of the table. Now, like I said, this is for the one I consider my small size, just because I don't have any smaller. But it's uh, 66 inches is what I call it, and uh, the um, and that refers to the circumference. But you can't just say two pieces 33 because it's a little bit shorter than because of the overlap so I say 33 would be half but then I add three inches to each piece so it's actually this would be like 36 Actually, we need two, but we need uh, them to be mirror images of each other. Those holes are what I'm marking there, the holes I'm marking, those are where the lace goes and that's how this the two halves are attached. And that gives you a, a joint, top and bottom, and makes it fit a lot better. You wouldn't have to, but I line these with suede, um, and they, they get sewn all the way around. Um, so I now I have to mark off for the lace now. Um, it would make sense to have a pattern for this as well, but I don't. So I normally come down six or seven inches. I think I'll come down six. So that marks the first seam. Now I set my dividers. for the inch and an eighth measurement. I believe it was an 
inch and an eighth, wasn't it? I don't like have to check, but I don't like being wrong either. So it was inch and an eighth. So anyway, I just step it off. And you're looking for, well, you can cram as many in as you can. You can just make a comfortable amount. Um, if it was a 45, quite often you go in six round increments. Um, with a 12 gauge, I don't know that it really matters like that, but. Okay, and I'm counting spaces because that, that's what I'm, I'm interested in is the lace, uh, the loops. Now, um, so I think this is in the viewfinder. I think I set it up. Yes, that's good. You're able to see the edge of the table. And I use the edge of the table. I bring the cutting mat right over, make a little room. And then I set my dividers for... Um, the width of the two edges were outside of the stitching, okay? So, it's a little bit of math here. You've got a one inch wide strap lace, and you want about a sixteenth for the stitch on the outside of that and a sixteenth on the outside of this. So you want about an inch and an eighth. So you take two and a half minus inch and an eighth and that is inch and three eighths. So then you take half of that and that is um, eleven sixteenths. So that's what I set my dividers for. And with this over here, against right up to the edge, I use this. This is a, just a carpenter speed square, but it works pretty good. You line that up with the f so the the so the strap is and the square are making contact, proper contact. I I use the edge of the cutting mat too to help. And then you line it up with your dot, and you make two marks in from the edge both ways. Do it again. I use the one point of the divider to um, pick up my original um, marking uh, punch mark or um, divider mark. Now for those who can't follow what I'm doing, what I have just accomplished is I've marked the, I've, I've indicated, I have indicator marks, these ones and these ones are rows on the outside, and that is where that last stitch and the first stitch will go. Now of course in practice, um, I don't worry about hitting them exactly, but if if you, uh, the closer you can come, the better. And then your lace ends up being centered on your uh, main belt. I have to swing that around for the last one. Now I normally just 
deepen them a little with the with the regular awl just to make sure I emphasize the hole or the punch mark. is and that is ready for stitching so I'm going to do the other one and I'll bring you back when I start the lace now we're back for the lace so this will get beveled eventually but this is that's not where I start so the first thing I do of course, if you remember when you're when you're cutting a piece of lace, quite often the ends are screwed up. So I'm going to cut that little bit off. So eventually this is going to get rounded around, uh, rounded off. But I'm, so I'm just going to come in and make a little mark. I'm just clear the end, just enough for the punch to work, and then I come in five eighths. So that is where we're going to start. I'm going to flip this around. Now, like I said before, uh, along the lace, the length along the lace is two and a quarter. So I set my dividers for two and a quarter. And then we start stepping it off. And what we want, one, two, is 18, same as the uh, same as the main body. So that's 18. Now if it's not already eminently clear, take your time and make sure you measure right the first time. That was the 5 8 and then I just left a little bit on there. So um, now we want to do something similar as we did with the other piece. I bring the speed square over line this up along the edge. This time I just take my uh, regular awl and you want to bring this over so that everything is lined up and you're on your your little mark and just scribe a line. Okay. Now that line ends up being square with the edge of the um, lace. And you could do it with just the lace, but the edge of the cutting mat gives it some stability. It keeps it in place more than just the edge of the um, lace would be. So that is where we go with that. Now, one more thing I can do here right now, and that is the uh, the holes. Um, this is something that 
has been done. Nobody, know, I, well, I don't know if anybody knows why. It it lets you see the cartridges through the lace. I really don't know if there's a practical reason for it, but and that's probably shaking the camera, but you'll have to bear with me. But anyway, I just line it up by all day, and basically I'm squaring or centering it in the little rectangles that I've made side to side being more important than end ways but uh, and as as you can guess I didn't measure anything um, I just hit it up and and hit it um, if you were going to do this and you were scared you weren't going to get it in the center well you know you can always measure And this would be another spot you could, if you wanted to, um, uh, use a, a tool like a, a star or or a, a flower, maybe. Um, that would be something else. So well, that is the holes done. I, uh, I'm going to bevel this. Um, so I'm going to move the camera. Okay, so this is going to be a, a short little bit, but I'm just going to bevel this. This is my apparatus you've seen in other videos, and by far the quickest way to do this job. And you could go through the process of burnishing this edge that you've just created. Um, I have found that it's not an important use of your time because generally by the time you get done with your sewing, uh, the burnishing is ruined anyway. So I don't bother. Um, that's up to you, of course, if you're the one doing it. Um, so I'm going to, I got one more thing to do to that and then will be sewing. Yeah, so I should mention that these holes, I punched them with a 5 16 round punch. And the only thing that's left after it's beveled is to just round off the end. there. That is our, our lace ready for um, sewing, which will be the next thing, and I'll bring you back for that. Yeah, so we're back, and uh, I'm going to try to sew this 
lace on. I wanted to zoom in on the area that's where the sewing is so you won't be able to see everything else is going on. The big thing other than that is just uh, holding on to the belt and just keeping it to, out of your way and stuff. But um, I can't hold the camera and do the sewing, so we'll have to make do. So I start that needle, I put it down in the first hole, and I'm going to uh, t make three stitches and then back stitch to start. Now this is a 5100 Texo, which is a uh, their big machine. It's similar to a Class 4 Cobra. Um, very good machine, lots heavy for this. And I've got uh, 207 thread in it. So we backstitch and get our thread started and then we just start in. So you take your stitch line across your lace, starting and stopping off of the lace so it binds the edge down. I take one stitch lengthwise the belt, that's just to get clear of the, of the fold, and then diagonally across the space in between the stitch lines. And uh, diagonal is important. Um, at some point, somebody decided that diagonal stitches across there would wear less than if they were straight across. Um, so generally, diagonal stitches is what's done for that reason.
Now the the diagonal line, I'm not following a line. I didn't mark a line on there, but once you get the thing, the, the once you get ready to start the diagonal, uh, you just aim it at the other hole. You're looking right down the, where you want the stitches to go. It's quite easy just to make a straight stitch line that way. Now, I suppose it's something else that isn't necessarily readily apparent. Uh, this machine is fitted with a needle positioning system, so when you when you stop stitching, the needle locks down in the down position. Um, so it always ends in that position unless you choose to move it out of that position. So uh, you just you just stop stitching the needles down you just lift your presser foot and um, swing it on the needle which gives you the control you need for making the changes in direction the other thing is I should mention that I didn't is the the presser foot it's a left toe presser foot uh, the right I don't well I have a, a double toe or a right toe, but this is a left toe. And that refers to this, okay? It's a walking foot. The center foot is this part in here, but the, the left toe is this. And you need that to clear on this side over here where the where the fold is. You may notice, I don't know if you can see it from there, but the belt, as you do this, it curls uh, just from the pressure of the stitch and the sewing being, you know, it, it puts pressure on it and it twists. But that, that'll that come out, you can just uh, kind of stretch it and work with it and get that clear, uh, get rid of the, the um, curl to it. Uh, when you're done.
So that's it. I'll uh, move the camera over and give you a better look. So, with the two pieces sewn, this is what we have. Now this one I straightened out, more or less. Uh, this one is the way they end up, uh, straight from the sewing machine. Um, it's because of the tension put on the thing by the stitching. Um, you wouldn't notice it quite so much with hand sewing, but there's quite a lot of tension with a machine stitch. Anyway, I'll show you how to straighten that out. But this one here, we uh, we have left. Um, I've got to hide these uh, threads on the where I start uh, with the machine stitch, and I usually have a quite a a, a long um, tag on my thread, and that's because when you start the stitch line you have to um, hang on to the thread so I give myself plenty of uh, thread to hold on to but this end here is just a matter of uh, bringing the, the tail that's on the top back through the back where it doesn't show snipping it off a little bit long and then burning them. This thread is uh, bonded nylon so it melts, makes a little ball and then you flatten it off. This end is where I ended off so it's a lot shorter. No reason to leave it long. And I just put it uh, these needles are from Tandy. They're a call. They call them a stitching needle. They're just a a blunt needle, but they have a, a big eye in them, and they uh, you can fit the the um, machine thread through it. You need the big eye with the machine thread because it has no wax on it. It's uh, uh, by the time you get done sewing it, it's sometimes. Um, bigger than what will go through a regular leather needle. So that is done till that. I'm going to show you how to straighten this now. It curls up if left to its own and it's just it's just annoying. Um, it, it'll probably straighten out over time but all I do is I just bend it the other way, stretch it like this work with it a little and that is pretty much how it's left. Now this design um, if you were making it uh, for a shotgun shells and you were stitching the loops you could leave it unlined and it would be basically done you could punch your holes and uh, put your lace you lace your two pieces together you, you probably would uh, bevel the edges and and burnish them but you know you're you're getting fairly close because the back is fairly smooth uh, the way I do them is I line them with suede and then they're a little bit heavier, a little bit nicer, a little bit stiffer and um, so that's what we're going to do but you could certainly you know pretty much be done at, at this point. If you are going to make uh, one of these for um, like uh, a 45 or a uh, 38 and you're going to use the other method of bullet loop uh, installation which is the oblong punch uh, like this a and then weave the the, loop, the lace material through uh, it's going to make the back lumpy and I find that the, the uh, suede lining makes it really nice um, not so necessary with this but it's still a nice touch so we're going to line this 
that's the next thing. So I'm going to uh, move the camera and get set up and we'll move on to that. So we're set up. Now I don't know what your shop is like, but mine, usually it's difficult to find a spot on the, my normal bench for doing any big jobs. So I set up this piece of plywood quite often for uh, jobs like this. And um, because it's a temporary thing, it doesn't accumulate all the little bits and pieces that normally are on my regular bench. So this is a piece of suede. Uh, I believe it's three to four ounce. Uh, not, that's not important. Um, it's, um, it's a double shoulder, which makes it a little on the narrow side, but for some things, but it's fine for this. I sit down and work at this because it's just easier. I've always used uh, LePage's contact cement, but I got a hold of some of this. This is, uh, um, well, what is it? The can's back to me. Oh, that'll come to me tonight while I'm asleep. Anyway, just another brand of contact cement, but it is quite a bit different. Really, the contact cement is all about where you can get it the easiest and, uh, of course, cheap or expensive makes a difference, but pretty well anything will work. Big, big thing is preparing the leather properly, more important than the actual glue that you use. Now, uh, of course, the suede is already rough. This leather, I'm going to be gluing the flesh side, but some of this finished leather, you have to rough it up. But luckily, this piece is not that way, so I can get away without any extra work. Now, the only thing, the only tip I would give here as far as the, you're cutting your piece is you want extra all the way around. Uh, don't skip too much. Um, I like, you know, at least a half an inch. Um, probably an inch wouldn't be too much. And what that allows is uh, on your lining, that we're talking about the lining, is you can... Uh, uh, you don't have to go right out to the edge with your glue, so it makes it quicker and easier to apply the glue. Also, you don't have to hit it just perfect when you're laying it down. Um, and uh, compared to the leather that I'm holding here, you know, the main body leather, uh, pretty near any veg tan, that you're talking about uh, suede is far cheaper so you know as far as what you should waste if you're going to waste anything the suede would be the first choice um, that's just economics the uh, 
but you want a little bit extra. You don't have to run the glue right to the edge and you still have a little bit of wiggle room when you lay it down. Now ideally when you're gluing something like this, you want to run the brush off of the edge rather than onto it, if you know what I mean. So you go like this rather than like this. So, and that just means that the glue doesn't pile up on the edge. Uh, however, um, sometimes you can get away with it. I have found that this leather, since it's finished, uh, the glue doesn't stick to the surface so it's easy to remove the, on the surface so if you have leather like that that's a bonus uh, if it's regular unfinished tooling leather then you want to be more careful because the glue will soak into the gray inside and by the time you get to it it's gonna it's gonna be a problem and if the glue soaks into the grain side a little spot of it uh, then you pretty much have to sand it off to, especially if you're going to try to dye it afterwards, because the dye won't soak in, un won't soak in where the glue is. But I have found that a little piece of, um, uh, uh, even probably even a scouring pad like like a, one of those green pads. But I have these uh, maroon colored ones. They're uh, and I just take a little corner, I think you can see that, a little corner, they're scotch bright. I just take a little corner of that and, and scrub it a little. It doesn't remove the grain. All it does is get rid of the, it will leave a mark though. So it's better if you don't have to do that. And this glue takes longer to dry than the other glue I'm used to. So we have to give it a little longer. I'm going to shut off the camera while I wait. So I believe this will work now. Um, I should mention I, I had a chance to look at the glue and it's bird cement. So some of you probably already use that. You already have heard of it. Uh, it's uh, what most leather crafters talk about. Um, it's actually for shoe repair, but it's it's really good glue, and I'm sure it's lots strong. I'm not smitten with it, but it's not readily available around here. Um, I know some places, I'm sure, it's more available, but around here it's not, and the stuff at the hardware store is dries quicker and is a thinner consistency and it may not hold as well but I'm not asking it to hold you know I'm not holding a shoe on a, on a, on a, on, or a sole on a shoe and expecting the glue to do the work. I'm putting it on there and holding it temporarily until I can get it sewn on. So, and that is what I do for that. Now, course I'm gonna to have to do the other one um, but I might as well finish this one to to a point and then shut the camera off so at this point I'd, I'd, I'd sew it and I come in there oh it's probably more than three sixteenths of an inch less than a quarter uh, it's uh, whatever looks good to you to, for me I like it a little wider than some um, but uh, you just trace it around um,
just like that. So I'm going to do the other one to this point, and then I'm going to set up the camera and you can watch me edge sew it. <laughs> 